while we crib and whine about everything that is wrong with our side our tendency to put in action our thought our tendency to step on the ground and to do something about it is almost always lacking despite having a tradition of debating and despite having ancestors like shankaracharya to look up to this is a side today which has not lived up to those traditions for the simple reason that you have abandoned those traditions we whine we gripe and we constantly complain about the lack of an ecosystem using all sorts of excuses available to us saying we don't have the material resources any support that comes from the state can only encourage an existing talent pool where is the talent pool that we have created today how many of us have taken serious interest in indology we have lost the battle as far as humanity is concerned we are so hell bent on churning out engineers and medical professionals and people of all sorts of views except in the humanities side you have allowed humanities to be taken over by someone with a western interest without realizing that humanities constantly affects your life on a daily basis if you're watching television if you're watching a news channel or if you're reading a history textbook or if you're reading something related to literature each of these things relate to humanities in the earlier times there was the decency of agreeing on the rules of the debate there was the decency of agreeing what shall be the terms of the debate and what metrics would be applied to decide who has won and who's lost today that's no more the case it's a question of competing narratives it's a question of who has the most prevalent ego system in order for him to reach out to the maximum number of people a civilized debate perhaps is a concept of a bygone era because neither party will agree that it's wrong that's the reality of the day we live in according to me in order for us to assure an indic renaissance unless and until we dig deep into our own dialectical traditions our own traditions of debating our own intellectual traditions we will constantly find ourselves floundering when faced with a motivated opposition there's always the constant thing that i get to hear they seem to have access to a better media ecosystem they seem to have access to better resources they seem to have patronage from the best of people possible and from the powers that be because we don't have any of these things our voices are not heard and that seems to be the constant refrain in each discussion that i've been whenever i've spoken of an indic renaissance each time we take a position which is at at loggerheads with theirs we are bound to be branded and we are bound to be silenced and the moment i am given a certain brand whether or not point of view that i put forth has any merit or not people will stop listening to me it's come to a point where branding has become a precursor to silencing so if i write the book no matter how scholastically deep it may be no matter how much of research i may have undertaken the moment i am told that he comes from a certain faction he comes from a certain ideological backdrop he represents a certain world view he represents a certain point of view that will be the end of your perception as far as my work is concerned you will not see whether the work stands on its own two feet as far as its merits are concerned so in a situation such as this what do you do how do you make your voices heard why do you need to be heard in the first place it's for a different reason while we crib and whine about everything that is wrong with our side our tendency to put in action our thought our tendency to step on the ground and do something about it is almost always lacking there is a serious mismatch in the depth that we attribute to the philosophical foundations of our forefathers and our initiative or our inclination to live and practice those ideas in the first place so for us most of these topics have been relegated to post dinner katha karakshepam as far as i am concerned beyond that those topics have not acquired any significance beyond that those topics do not find any kind of traction beyond that we don't seem to be acting on any of those ideas if we have to usher an indic renaissance we need to understand why do we need it in the first place why is an indic identity necessary in the first place an indic identity is necessary in the first place because unless and until you impute a certain identity to yourself you allow outsiders to mold and fashion your identity a vacuum with respect to your identity allows somebody else to cast and impose a certain identity on you which is why it is important for us to craft an identity for ourselves and that is the indic identity what is the meaning of an indic identity why are we not using any other term for it why indic in the first place because the word indic is capable of encompassing within its scope several ways of life several value systems not all of which may be able to live with each other if you do not give this identity to yourself 
take it from me in writing you will find articles being written to the effect that there is not much of a difference between the united states of america and india in so far as it being a melting pot of multiple races and multiple cultures and therefore there is no indic way of life and there is nothing that is native to this particular land and the moment you try and say there is something that belongs to this particular land you will be branded a xenophobe someone who has a problem with anybody entering this country which is why it is important for you to have an indic identity unless and until you are in a position to have access to an ecosystem that ventilates your point of view you will always be in a position where you will be seen as a minority as a fringe or as a non intellectual base every time you watch a debate on television you will always find three articulate people speaking immaculate english representing a certain point of view and anyone who represents the indic standpoint or the indic point of view will be a person who is inarticulate who struggles with english and who will come out as a person who is a misogynist of the first order who is a patriarch of the first order have you wondered why this is the case this is simply because in my limited experience when i have taken part in ndtv debates i have seen that there is a calculated attempt to push a certain stereotype with respect to the indic point of view and we are also partly responsible for this you speak of gay rights you speak of tribal rights or you speak of rights of women the indic standpoint is never there at all the indic position never finds any ventilation at all if i know for a fact that i'm going to be outnumbered in a discussion with people from the other side of the ideological fence it's all the more reason for me to go there otherwise the impression that most audience will get is that this is the only point of view that exists and there is no alternative point of view notwithstanding the fact that i'll be isolated or i will be a minority voice as far as that particular discussion is concerned i'm hoping that people get to hear even my point of view before they form an opinion on that particular issue ultimately it boils down to one thing i need to be absolutely aware of the fact that am i the right person to represent a certain point of view on a public platform if i am not articulate enough or if i don't have the skill set or if i'm not informed as far as that particular issue is concerned i must desist from going there because i'm not just hurting my own reputation i am also hurting the reputation of the position that i stand for unfortunately there's nothing that you can do you can't stop people from appearing on television studios you can only try and create more voices which can reach out to public independent of what is being shown on television channels the tendency to assume that the indic side is incapable of engaging in an intellectual discussion is not just a stereotype that is pushed by the other side but we have also contributed to it why is it that in no free speech debate or in a privacy issue or on issues with respect to women's rights or with respect to lgbt rights or with respect to tribal rights or environmental issues we are not to be found anywhere at all for the simple reason that we have allowed these issues to be co-opted and hijacked by the other side and two we have never fundamentally put faith in developing our arguments within the constitutional framework consequently if you have not treated a constitutional debate as an option on the table which you have to work upon you will always think of it as too much of an intellectualism you will say this is too much of academic discussion which i am not interested in today it has come to a point that academics and so called buddhijeevis are the people who are dictating the course of the national discourse on all issues of major concern gatekeepers of academia are people who come from a certain ideology imagine you are a student who is pursuing your phd and there are so many people here the accept acceptance of your thesis is dependent on there being a resonance between your wavelength and your guide's wavelength and if the wavelength or let's say the guide happens to be someone who's particularly rigid about his ideological standpoints and your area of research is something that relates to that ideological standpoint your career is in his hands you think all of these people truly believe what they write they don't some of them do it because it's a question of survival and then they realize that if i don't subscribe to this point of view i will be kicked out of the ecosystem i will never be made a part of the ecosystem i can never aspire for greener pastures i will never get a recommendation for a full bright scholarship or a road scholarship abroad as far as my future is concerned so i might as well do this despite having a tradition of debating and despite having ancestors like shankaracharya to look up to this is a side today which has not lived up to those traditions for the simple reason that you have abandoned those traditions we are more than happy to do the grassroots work but we are not interested in actually developing it into a certain argument it's important every issue has at least three or four layers one is the intellectual layer where it's an argument between two people who are qualified in the particular subject second is an argument between people who are grassroots workers who are activists therefore there has to be a different skill set which you need for that particular thing then there is a middle layer where you have a public intellectual who can bridge the gap between the grassroots worker and the intellectual and can reach out to the common audience facts entirely go to the dustbin and narrative takes over the moment you have an ecosystem which is capable of of reaching out to the public we whine 
we gripe and we constantly complain about the lack of an ecosystem using all sorts of excuses available to us saying we don't have the material resources. Although there is a certain dispensation in power today, it has not committed those resources to patronizing a certain intellectual ecosystem. But the fact of the matter is this. Any support that comes from the state can only encourage an existing talent pool. Where is the talent pool that we have created today? The state cannot create talent. The state can only encourage talent. The state can only act as a force multiplier as far as an existing talent pool is concerned. How many of us have taken serious interest in Indology? In coming out with textbooks which are not written by foreigners as far as our history is concerned? Why is it that every major textbook and every major commentary on Indic studies comes from people who are not from Indian institutions and who are not of Indian origin? Because we have entirely abandoned it. One of the fundamental reasons that we find ourselves in the situation is we have lost the battle as far as humanities is concerned. We are so hell-bent on churning out engineers and medical professionals and people of all sorts of views except in the humanities side. We have allowed humanities to be taken over by someone with a Western interest without realizing that humanities constantly affects your life on a daily basis. If you're watching television, if you're watching a news channel, or if you're reading a history textbook, or if you're reading something related to literature, each of these things relate to humanities. If you look at people from our side today, so-called Indic side, who are focusing on humanities, we have done it only on a part-time voluntary basis. And then after the age of 50, after having earned all the wealth that we can, we then decide that I need to dedicate my life to this particular side and then I start becoming an expert on history, on Sanskrit and whatnot. Compare that with the other side and you have the answer crystal clear right in front of you as to why we are where we are today. Young students of any humanity groups, they have been successfully packaged and sold this idea that free speech belongs to this particular camp, that civil liberties belongs to this particular camp and therefore they are inclined to go there. Every idealistic impulse of a youngster is being tapped into by this particular side whereas we are busy talking about justifying caste system and whatnot. You take every major publication, their pet issues will be only this. One, Article 370. How do you abolish reservations? Point number two. Point number three. No, 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 the caste system is bad today, but that was not the original intention. We try and justify the past without understanding that you need to choose issues of the present for you to be relevant and for you to be able to reach out to people today. What the caste system was 1000 years ago or 1500 years ago, does it really matter to a person who is actually a victim of that particular system in any part of the country? It doesn't make a difference to him. You can keep shouting and crowing about the origins of the caste system or how great it was when it came out. But unless and until your action or your initiative is consistent with your belief, then you're all talk and no action. Indians by default are driven by incentives. We are creatures of incentives. Unless and until there is an angle or there is a certain aspect which is which is helpful to you on the personal front, you really don't take the initiative. The other side has successfully managed to cultivate scholarships, fellowships, programs, incentives, all of which are, are fashionable. They are packaged in the best format possible. They are given the scholarly depth necessary, even if it's based on flimsy foundations, so that people aspire for it. At any given point of time, there are so many students across universities, across streams who aspire for road scholarships. Give me one example of a road scholarship which India has come out with in order to attract the best of brains from across the streams. You don't have a comparable scholarship at all. And if you were to read into the history of the Rhodes Scholarship, it's perhaps it was set up by perhaps one of the most racist persons of his time. And yet today, Rhodes Scholarship has become a symbol of egalitarian, universalist, and libertarian values. This is the power of narrative where you're entitled to recraft and refashion history to suit your current agenda. We may have managed to understand how to crack the game of elections, but as far as the public narrative is concerned, and as far as the messaging is concerned, and as far as the intellectual ecosystem is concerned, you're nowhere close to it. For the simple reason that you have not invested sufficiently in it. And importantly, it is not the job of people on the Indic side to defend the government. That's not your primary priority. That is not what you're meant for. Governments will come, governments will go. Dispensations will come, dispensations will go. You are fighting for a certain idea, you are fighting for a certain idea of India, you are fighting for an Indic civilization narrative which has to transcend governments and time. It is rumored that the 
Communist Party of China has a civilization narrative going for the next 100 years as to how it wants to be seen for the next 100 years. Regardless of who is in power, there is a consistency in terms of what China is and how it projects itself, what are its interests and how does it go about protecting those interests. But as far as we are concerned, there is no Indic civilization narrative. We do not have a clear picture as to who we are. We do not have a clear picture as to how do we represent ourselves to the world from a civilizational standpoint. We have not actually crafted that particular identity at all. This may be for a different reason also. Perhaps before India was politically united and became India as we know it today, each of these princely states in each of these regions may have had an individual identity. But the fact remains that at least for the outsider and the traveler who's come to this part of the world, he has seen a cultural commonality as far as all parts of the country are concerned. Therefore, whether or not there was this political concept of India which existed before 1947, the notion of India and the idea of India existed. Unfortunately, those building blocks of identity have not been used. We have not built on that particular identity because creation of an identity has very tangible consequences. Till date, after 70 years of the creation of this Republic of India, you still don't have a clear cultural identity. You do not have a civilization narrative to present. You continue to allow third parties to craft your narrative. You have given them all the room that they need. The need of the hour is this. Perhaps the last wave was based on part-time volunteerism where people out of their good intention decided to do something for the Indic side after the age of 50, after the age of 40. But now you have arrived at a point where the battle of ideologies is visible for you to see on a day-to-day -day basis on every topic. Almost everything in India revolves around identity politics. Therefore, it has come to a point where you really need to give it its due and take an interest in it and start investing in it. The next wave as far as the Indic Renaissance is concerned must consist of people who devote themselves to this cause full-time. You need full-time journalists, you need full-time historians, full-time indologists, full-time lawyers, people who take an active interest in this and build on this particular thing. It is rumored that the number of branches that the RSS has in this country is about 70,000. And I'm giving a rough figure that each branch has at least 10 people. What does that translate to? 7 lakh people across the country? This is an organization that constantly bleeds and groans about Sanskrit not getting its due in this country. That Sanskrit is not adopted, it's not spoken, and they've always called themselves the guardians of this particular language. I have a simple question to ask. 70,000 into 10 is 7 lakh. How many of these 7 lakh people have been taught Sanskrit by the RSS itself? An organization which wants the rest of the country to learn this language itself has not deemed it important to teach the language to its own people. What does it say? As far as a third party is concerned, this is a hypocritical position. You want the rest of the world to learn this language, but you have not been able to teach this language to your own people when you have specific wings which are dedicated to the teaching of this language. I'm sure people have heard of this branch called the Sanskrit Bharati. You have a wing dedicated to it, but you've not taught it. Second, there is a fundamental inferiority complex on the Indic side which needs to be overcome. You can continue to gripe about the other side, but unless and until you know how the other side operates, you will not be in a position to respond to it. If you vilify English, you have effectively given them complete hold over English media. If you say that English does not belong to this country, you live in the age of dinosaurs because you fail to understand that whether you like it or not, English has become a popular language in this country. The very same people when pushed to the wall, they'll say, no, no, English has several words that comes from Sanskrit. Is it your position that English is an Indian language or not? At least clarify that. You can't say that English has several words which come from Sanskrit and also say that English is a foreign language. On a more practical level, you have not learnt the art of mastering the rules of the game so that you're in a position to respond to them and then decide the rules of the game yourself. When you're in a position of weakness, the first thing that you're supposed to do is this. Understand the rules of the game that have been set by the other side, master the rules of the game, and then aspire to come to a point where you're in a position to change the rules of the game yourself. But at least until that particular point of time, you need to continue to play by those rules until you're in a better stage to alter the rules of the game. Every time I, I go to a discussion, this first thing that they say is, somehow the English media is against us. Somehow, this, this, the Lutians media is against us. The Lutians media, for all practical purposes, has no reason to be for you or against you. It is only going in the direction where power sways. It is only going in the direction where money exists and where there is influence. Whoever is willing to give them importance, whoever is willing to cultivate them, you'll have them. It's not impossible for you to create your voice. It's not impossible for you to create your own platform. But 
you need to understand the importance of creating a platform you need to understand that this is very very important unless and until you realize the value of a constitutional argument or a dialectical debate you will always be anti intellectual you will always be afraid of an argument you will always flounder when you are called to debate on all the positions that you hold if a public debate were to be held today how many voices from the indic side can we identify who can hold their own against the best of voices which the other side can field and prove their point of view in a language that they understand handful it's literally a handful therefore the indic renaissance or the civilization renaissance that we speak of is not going to come only at the ground level or it's not going to happen at one level it has to happen at multiple levels a thousand different revolutions a thousand different mini revolutions have to bloom and blossom across the country if at all there has to be an indic renaissance in the future and for that to happen you need to master the art of debating the art of articulation the art of building an argument and giving depth to your argument every time you speak of sanskrit there is always one gentleman who says that even nasa or some other organization is recognized that sanskrit is the best language for computer programming that is all we know about sanskrit beyond that we know jack is that true does it have a basis is it scientifically verifiable or is this hearsay was this a random statement made in some article or was the entire article dedicated to this particular issue has anybody undertaken that particular research that is our problem we seem to be purveyors of myths or at least we don't know how to prove that something is not a myth somebody constantly hails this this as a slur at you you're an idol worshipper you're a cow worshipper either you repel that and say i'm not this or you try and prove why this is the case and why there is nothing to be ashamed about but you will never do that for the simple reason that you would rather hide under a rock and evade that particular argument than meet that argument head on and that is the reason that each time you run away from a certain discussion you are gradually encouraging within yourself the inability to repel an argument on an intellectual level unless and until you hone the ability and sharpen the ability to constantly engage with the other side you will never be in a position to win the hearts and minds of the popular public most people don't even know who controls the wealth that comes from the temple who controls the resources of the temple why is it that you have a hindu endowments board in every secular government state government but you don't find similar establishments or similar ministries for places of worship of other communities what does this tell you you have not taken an interest in this it doesn't matter to us we are fundamentally survivalists we are fundamentally individualists as long as you have green up pastures to go after and you're in a position to secure your own nest you're in a position to further your own feather your own nest you have no interest in seeing beyond that please remember that there are three stages that a civilization goes through usually one where it is aware of its identity second where it is in the process of losing its identity third when it completely loses its identity and when there is a vacuum something is bound to fill that vacuum if you don't fill it up yourself and you create an identity for yourself somebody else is going to do for that so we may be progenitors of an advanced civilization but we are certainly at an advanced stage of decay and unless and until we identify as to who we are and what we wish to do in the future you will always find yourself in the politically incorrect position of defending your own faiths you'll find yourself in the tragic position of having to defend every tradition which is native to this particular land because they will come and tell you you are fools your forefathers were fools the entire value system that your society has followed for thousands of years is based on myth and superstition and nothing beyond that and you will not even have credible answers to give because you don't know who you are and where you come from therefore indic renaissance is impossible until we go beyond twitter and facebook and equip ourselves with facts with information looking at our own history and it's not really difficult to do between the 18th century and early 20th century giants have literally identified and written fantastic books on india on india's past you only need to dig it up you only need to arm yourself with those facts you only need to recraft it and represent it because if you don't do so all you're left with is post 20th century and 21st century books all of which has been written by others with a specific agenda and a specific interest to push almost in every fight or in every initiative you will find yourself alone it either becomes a caste related issue or it becomes a region related issue or a language related issue but it never transcends beyond that hopefully there will come a time where we will recognize that if we do not find for ourselves a common identity we will be picked apart one by one
and we will not even know it. Riots happen in Gujarat. It matters to people from that particular faith across the country, across the world. Riots happen with respect to a different community in Bengal. It doesn't matter to anyone who lives in the neighboring state of Bengal. It doesn't make news at all. It doesn't shake a single soul. It doesn't stir a single conscience. How many of you have heard of Dhulagad riots in Bengal? Were there any protests for those people in this part of the country? While there are protests for Rohingyas all over the country who don't even belong to this country. Apathy is the beginning of destruction of a civilization. We will all respond to attacks on our caste, but we will never respond to attacks on your faith. That is the reality. If somebody hurts me personally or affects my caste identity, I will go after that person. There will be a riot for that. But when somebody openly slanders against your faith, you will conveniently remain silent and you will dissociate yourself from that particular position because you will say, I don't care, it doesn't matter to me. Therefore, that sense of apathy as far as your Hindu identity is concerned or your Indic identity is concerned is, is partly responsible. And here, perhaps you will have to blame the previous generation for not ins instilling those values in you or to tell you that this identity matters, it's important, be proud of it. You need not hate somebody else. You need not grow up with hatred of any other community. But surely there's nothing wrong in you growing up being proud of your community. After years of going through nasty experience from 780 till perhaps even today, we still haven't learned our, le learned our lessons. You may not be interested in your identity as a Hindu or whatnot, but somebody else seems to be interested in your identity as a Hindu. Somebody else is interested in your identity as a Sikh. Somebody else is interested in your Indic identity. His identity may have never mattered to you. Your identity may have never mattered to you. You're happy living with the other person, but he is not comfortable with your identity. And yet, you wish to live under the bubble, under the rock. That I'm so sorry, all points of view are the same. All opinions are the same. All worldviews are the same. All values are the same. If no two people can be the same, and no two people can have the same quality, how can two people have the same quality of opinions? How can the quality of opinions of two different people be the same? The problem is we have somehow managed to imbibe this particular tradition that do not judge thy neighbor. Because the moment you judge, you're seen as discriminating. You're seen as subscribing to a fascist ideology. It is important to judge. It is important to apply your faculties of discrimination to see what is right, what is wrong, who is right and who is wrong. Because if you can't speak the truth, if you do not have the guts to speak the truth, then you deserve to wither away. And you will. Most people, at least on our side, have this, this tendency to keep looking at Israel for an example. Look at them. Look at them. They've managed to create a state for themselves. They've managed to create an identity for themselves. Do you think that has happened without a problem? They were pushed to the brink of extinction. They lost 6 million people within a period of 6 years. And then they realized, if I don't stand up for myself, I'm going to be wiped out for eternity. Do we really want us to be pushed to that point before we learn our lessons and be reduced to a state whose size is less than the state of New Jersey. Israel from one end to another will not take more than two hours to traverse. A community which was otherwise the original inhabitants of that entire region has been reduced to that one small triangle, a sliver of a triangle in that particular place. Ask yourself, is our position any different? What were our borders before 1947? Where are we today? What is the consequence of alteration of demographics thanks to illegal immigration that's happening in this country? How many people do you think are illegal immigrants in this country from Bangladesh? How many illegal Bangladeshis do you think are in this country? Two to three crores was a figure given in early 2000s. Today, we are looking at six to seven crores. There was a time when this problem was limited only to the northeast of the country and we've always given stepmotherly treatment to the northeast, therefore it didn't make too much of a difference to us. But it is now no more a problem that is limited to the northeast. Look at the statistics, look at the figures and you'll ask yourself, what is happening? You should ask yourself, why is it that every time we raise questions with respect to the identity of this country, we are hell-bent on denying the origins of this country, the traditions of this country and where we come from? Constitution is not meant to erase history. Constitution is only meant to say, notwithstanding what may have happened in the past, people will be treated with equality and dignity. But that doesn't mean that we'll commit the same mistake for the next thousand years and pay the price for it. In your lifetime, this country and this society will change and this will no more be the place that you will even recognize. We may be thinking that we helped the creation of Bangladesh and therefore they are grateful to us. But we don't understand that Bangladesh was previously East Pakistan. So they made a choice in 1947. They carved for themselves a certain identity in 1947. Merely because they separated from West Pakistan doesn't change their original decision to stay away from secular India. Why is this important? Because as far as we are concerned, since we have, we have told ourselves that we don't have a specific identity, we don't seem to have a problem with illegal immigration also. 
because then we'll immediately cite an ancient indian tradition atithi devo bhava they have to come how can we behave like this as far as these people are concerned we have welcomed the jews we have welcomed the afghans we have welcomed the tibetans why can't we welcome these people have tibetans killed you in all the years that tibetans have lived in this country since their invasion since the invasion of their country have you heard one riot between tibetans and indians at least in the name of religion jews have been living in this country for millennia they too are a monotheistic faith have you heard of one problem between jews and non jews parsis have lived in this country they perhaps constitute the best definition of a minority because today their population is 60000 and even going down you've never had a problem as far as they are concerned so how is it that a position with respect to one particular group is immediately interpreted as an anti minority position when i don't seem to have a problem with any other minority they are minorities in the true sense of the word 10 years ago or 15 years ago those places where you would have comfortably been in a position to celebrate your festivals or enjoy your traditions and customs today you need permission in those places to celebrate your own festivals what has happened in calcutta what has happened in west bengal and the need for judicial intervention for you to be able to carry out your own processions and to celebrate your own festival is a wake up call for the rest of the country every festival has only become a commercial activity but its religious basis is being slowly secularized which means it's being dehinduized if you do not wake up right now in your own lifetime you will find a thousand war mongers and barbarians standing outside your home and asking you to give up give up your life or give up your faith if you think india is only a place where you earn a degree and run away to the west the next generation will not even have an in india to do so you will not be in a position to do that either importantly you can leave this country and run from one country to another but can you abandon your identity altogether that will continue to hound you and someone who has a problem with your fundamental identity it doesn't make a difference to him whether you're in india or any other place as long as you don't give up that particular identity he is going to come after you therefore an indic renaissance is not an academic discussion it is not a discussion meant for let's say wine tasting rooms or it's not a discussion meant for just books it has a very real relevance to the existential issues that face this country today so my request would be that we need to choose for ourselves how do we wish to contribute to this renaissance in one way or the other you can either be the financiers of this particular movement or you can be the influencers of this particular movement you can be the thought leaders of this particular movement or you can be the grassroots activist but you must take part in this particular movement in one way or the other because if you don't do so your children will not live in the same india that you lived and you certainly don't live in the same india that your parents lived so as far as i am concerned action is most important choose for yourselves one area where you think you're in, in a better position to contribute and focus on contributing it in one way or the other me as part of my work and my team have chosen the legal and the constitutional means to contribute in whichever small way that we can to push forth our point of view to push forth the point of view that the space for an indic identity is being encroached increasingly and there must be a constitutional resistance to it and that's what we are doing please choose for yourself a certain forum a certain field of activity a certain area of expertise dig deep into it and make sure that you contribute to it in one way or the other one of my most favorite statements is if you can't be a rana pratap at least be a bhamasha if you can't fight in the field of battle at least help those people who are taking the fire on a regular basis there is strength in numbers and therefore numbers matter and therefore demographics matter we are willing to treat everybody as our equal and for us it doesn't make a difference who comes from what faith but it is it seems to matter to the other side unfortunately so so wake up to this reality and find an area where you can contribute to the indic renaissance in one way or the other one is a tiger the other is a snake you need to be in a position to fight both the tiger and the snake which means you must have the wherewithal to resist direct confrontation you must also have the mental agility to fight the intellectual battle one thing that you must note until the british have set foot in this country hindus may have lost battle after battle war after war but they never lost respect for their faith or their roots or their hindu identity they they lost nothing because whoever came here with the intention of converting you wanted to kill you and he wanted to finish you or convert you but he never came out with a mechanism to fundamentally tell you that you are inferior through education through colonization and that is what 200 years of british rule did where systematically the education system was taken over you were deprived of the ability to bear arms you were also deprived of the ability to carry on your traditional knowledge systems coupled with the fact that he co-opted you so he managed to successfully create a divide as far as your own identity is concerned therefore what needs to be countered and i'll always welcome an open confrontational adversary as opposed to the sweet talking person who has an agenda and who's slowly pushing that agenda 
Unfortunately, an average parent is not interested in history. They're only interested in mathematics, physics, science, computer science, and whatnot. So history curriculum is not something that's going to bother anyone and nobody is going to lose sleep over it. If my son doesn't know good English, I will have a problem with it. But if my son doesn't know Indian history and doesn't know good history, it really doesn't make a difference to me. So since this is again a storm in a teacup, it's the concern of a minority, of a minority, it really doesn't make a difference. So the only way is for a large number of people to realize that history makes a difference to how we see ourselves in the long run. Products of these schools who come out with these thoughts that there is nothing to Hinduism beyond casteism, beyond sati, beyond burning widows and beyond widows living in Varanasi and all these things. If we don't realize the dangers of cultivating the next generation which comes up with these kind of thoughts, then I don't see what's the solution. Here the problem I think is also with control of temples from a different reason. Why can't a temple be in a position to run its own educational institution so that it can further its own traditions, create its own textbooks, explain the history of the particular place to the people who live in the particular place. But then again, it's in, it's in the hands of the government. Release of the temple from the hands of the government will open the doors to a lot of things. You will have the resources to fight fraudulent conversions. You will have the resources to take care of orphans. Therefore, if you need those resources, you need to fight. The worst part is the opposite side is bloody committed to what it wants to do. They are absolutely committed to their goals. They are crystal clear in what their goals are. You are not even clear as to our identity. Forget goals. 